Hey, NCA family, we're so glad you're here at the NCA The Church YouTube page. Don't forget, if you haven't already, go down, hit that subscribe button, stay up to date with everything happening here at the YouTube page. Also, if you haven't already, go to ncathechurch.com and stay up to date with anything happening here at NCA. There is something for you and your entire family here at MCA, and we're so glad that you're a part of our church, and that you're a part of our community, that you're a part of our family, and we welcome you, and we hope that you also have the heart of wanting to expose the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. Here's Pastor Dave with today's Amen. message. Welcome, Pastor Gabe. Sorry I took some of your time. All right. Check. Testing. I'm not muted. Hello, hello, hello. Check, check. Can you hear me now? My beard's just muffling it a little bit. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we are uh, going to um, finish off the New City Catechism today. And I know we're taking a question a week, and there's still one Wednesday left. But as Pastor just said, um, we are doing a special service next week. So um, we're not going to be, have time to get into the catechism um, for... For, for next week as we, we have some special plan for the service. Um, so tonight, uh, I want to try to answer both question 51 and 52, talk about it. Um, and and this will work, I think, because um, we spoke uh, in the last couple of weeks on the, um, the, the, that Jesus lives and that Jesus reigns. And then the catechism again takes us to the ascension of Jesus. And um, so I'm going to focus in on one part of that answer tonight. And hopefully that will also help us answer Question 52. Uh, so question 51's on the screen. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. We're going to try to do two questions in one night. Um, yes, great. So question 51 is on the screen. Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? And the answer, we can read it out, out loud all together. Christ physically ascended on our behalf, just as he came down to earth physically on our account. And he is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father, preparing a place for us, and also sends us his Spirit. So tonight we're going to be focusing on the preparing a place part, because question 52 um, is what hope does everlasting life hold for us? We can read it out loud, warm up for Sunday. It reminds us that this present fallen world is not all there is. Soon we will live with and enjoy God forever in the new city, in the new heaven and the new earth, where we will be fully and forever freed from all sin and will inhabit, re and will inhabit renewed resurrection bodies in a renewed, restored creation. Amen. Um, so we're going to get into that tonight. Like I said, I'm going to focus on uh, the fact that Jesus is preparing a place for you, um, you can turn to John chapter 14. Uh, this is where we see this in the text. And we'll be jumping from these first three verses uh, for the majority of the night. You'll see a lot of scriptures on there um, on your handout. I'm going to go through a lot of those very quickly. Um, so don't get too intimidated. John 14 is our main text. And uh, we're just going to be in the first three verses here in John chapter 14. It says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Amen. Um, life is filled with troubles. Amen. And, and we seem to be living in, in troubling times, in difficult times, um, in times where uh, disappointment is, is prevalent. Um, how many of you have experienced some disappointment in your life? Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, th this verse says, uh, it refers to our troubles, that our hearts can be troubled. I think disappointment is, is troubling. Um, and there are many disappointments. Um, we can be disappointed with ourselves. You ever been disappointed with yourself, right? You're like, man, Gabe, you should have done better. You, you should have said that. You shouldn't have did that. You should have lost that. Um, we we want to be strong, but we're often weak. We want to be successful, but we often experience failures. We want to be liked, but oftentimes people are not really likable and don't like us very much. 
We are also often disappointed with other people. Maybe you've been disappointed with your spouse, your kids, other people's kids. Uh, We can be disappointed with a friend, an employer, uh, uh, someone that we're having acquaintance with, someone that we uh, maybe just admire from a distance and we can be disappointed. And then we have circumstances that can be uh, a trouble to us as well. Um, Sometimes it's things that we can control and sometimes it's things we can't. Uh, Anytime you get to this time of year, people are often troubled by their finances, by the budget, uh, that we can't afford all the things we want to get, all the, all the fun things we want to do, all the presents we want to buy, or, or maybe we can't afford to, to really notch up the gifts as far as we want to notch them up for people we really care about. Or maybe you have a circumstance where you've lost a job, or, or perhaps you've even lost a loved one. We, we can face circumstances that are troubling. And then we have spiritual troubles. Troubles abound. You can have uh, what people have called the dark night of the soul, where it seems that God is absent, that your prayers aren't being heard. What do we do in moments of despair? Our world can be very troubling. And and so as you think about these two questions, uh, as we think about where Jesus is now, what he's doing, and what eternity will be like, I think the answer to those questions is the answer to removing our troubles if we know who Jesus is, and if we know where we're going, if we know our destiny is secure, if we think of him, we can overcome trouble. I believe, and I think God's word agrees, we can overcome the troubles of life just by reminding ourselves of the power and the promises of God, by reminding ourselves of the great gift it is to be in the presence of God, not just now, but forever. He, even tonight, we sang that song, Times of Refreshing, here in your presence. You think, of, you think of heaven and you think of endless refreshing, right? Endless in his presence, constantly in the presence of God. That, that, that moment you feel your soul being restored, your mind being renewed, only never ending, without ceasing, you are completely restored because you're in the presence of, of God. Uh, You can fill this in on your blanks. How do we live in troubling times? You fill your mind with thoughts of home. You fill your mind with thoughts of of home. In this text, um, some context to it, the disciples are... um, they're getting nearer to the cross and Jesus has told them that he's, he's leaving. And, and to the disciples, this is troubling. This is a troubling thing that could happen. Uh, this is maybe disappointing for them as they didn't fully understand it. They didn't fully grasp what Jesus meant when he said he was, he was leaving. Uh, they didn't fully understand the, 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 that over and over again, he kept telling them that he was uh, going home, that he was going to the cross, that he had to do these things, and yet they were still troubled by it. And so he takes these three verses to try to encourage them that they don't have to be troubled because he's doing something really wonderful. He's going not to abandon them, not to leave them without hope, but he's going to prepare a place for them. He's going to prepare a place for them. And so he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. A command, not a suggestion, a a command. Let not your hearts be troubled. And you, you can actually follow that command because of what he says next. Believe in God, believe also in me. Verse two, in my father's house are many rooms. If, we're, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to repair a place for you? And if I go to repair a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself and where I am, you may be also. The great encouragement we have in the face of trouble, the the, the great source and power that you have to, to not be troubled, to let not, to obey that command of Christ, to not be a troubled person in a troubling world is based on your understanding and your vision, your thoughts, your mind being filled with thoughts of home. It really is a wonderful thing Jesus gives us as he speaks of this, uh, this text 
is to strengthen Christians. It's not, uh, Christians are not to live in any season of life with some sort of, oh, pity me. The world is going crazy. The world is topsy-turvy, and I'm just holding on for dear life until Jesus returns. That is not how we're called to live. We're called to live as people who let not our hearts be troubled. No matter what the world does, no matter how much disappointment you face, no matter the sickness you face, no matter the desires you have that are unfulfilled, and no matter the worries that might come in front of your vision, you as a follower of God are told by Jesus as he tells his disciples to let not your hearts be troubled. And, and, and you might listen to that and be like, as if I have any control over that. But you do. You actually do. You, you see, the, the way you let your heart not be troubled is by letting your mind not get troubled. If you can control this, your heart will follow. So, so Jesus gives us his word. We're to be people of the word. We pour into the word. And as we get the word in our mind, our hearts all of a sudden are able to obey this command of Jesus to not be troubled regardless of what we face. T tonight, I just want to give you some thoughts on home to kind of finish off the, the year for Wednesday nights. And I'm excited next year, we're going to get into different series and kind of be jumping into different topics. And it's going to be a fun year. I'm excited for, for the Wednesday night Bible study next year. But tonight, I want to finish off with just some thoughts on our home. What our home in heaven might be like what our home in heaven has in store for us. And we need to talk about heaven. We need to fill our minds with heaven. And most people, even believers, don't actually think about heaven as their home very much. Most believers, I think, go through their day, day to day, week to week, month to month, with, with little to no thought of what heaven might be like, of what our home might have in store for us. And, and then we, we live troubled. We live with worries and anxieties and fears and we, to be beaten up by the world. And we wonder why. And I think, I think God's word directs our attention to fill our mind with thoughts of home and so then we can make it through this troubling time, this troubling world. But anytime you talk about heaven, um, it, you, you create a problem because for a lot of people, heaven's not an interesting subject. And you might laugh at that. You might giggle at, well, heaven's amazing. But for a lot of people, it's not very interesting. This wasn't always so. There was a time in history in the Western world where thoughts about the life to come were popular. This was like everyday language. You didn't talk about sports. You, you talked about theology. Theology wasn't for Bible college students. It was for everybody. Everybody talked about God and the things of God and their future home with God. There was a time where that was common conversation in the Western world. But now we live in a secular scientific age and uh, a lot of skepticism has come in. In today's world, thoughts of heaven seem to be either a form of like escapism or people are just trying to get like some pie in the sky idea, just escape from reality. And I don't wanna live in the pains of this world so I keep my mind on heaven. Some unrealistic expectations of, of clouds or or lights, or some mystical, spiritual thing. It, it becomes this kind of weird conversation, not the conversation we see in Scripture, because God's Word repeatedly draws us to this idea of heaven as a real place, a physical place, a place that is significant, not just because it's not here, but because it's special, and it's being worked on, it's being prepared for, for you. And so you can begin to fill these in, just some, some thoughts on our home. Number one, you belong in heaven. You belong in heaven. It, 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 he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? See, see if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, there is a place being prepared for you in heaven. 
that is your home. So if you ever feel out of place in this world, if you ever feel like you don't belong, if you ever feel like this world just doesn't seem to fit the, your way of thinking, that's good. <laughs> that's a good thing because you belong in heaven. You don't belong here. I mean, you're supposed to be here. You have a purpose to be here. God has things in store for you. Uh, yeah, you're definitely supposed to be here. But, but your eternal reality, your citizenship is in heaven. That's where you belong. Uh, last week, we talked about the difference between believers and unbelievers in the face of death. I got a funeral. And, and I told you that a, a lot of times you, you can tell someone who's a Christian or not a Christian by the way they grieve for someone who's lost because they either have hope of e eternal life with Jesus or they, they don't. And you can tell by the way someone grieves. Today I want to say the, the opposite is also true. The life of a Christian it is not to be like the life of an unbeliever. You can tell the difference, not just by some, the way someone grieves in the face of death, but you can tell the difference of a genuine follower of Christ in the way that they live their life. In good times and bad times. They live differently because they know their destiny. They know that their home is in heaven. And so the things of this earth, it's like the things of this earth matter so little to them. The things of this earth that they understand to be fleeting and passing away, even their, their time and, and, and their family, they, they hold them lovingly and they cherish them, but they hold them with open hands, knowing that it's, it all belongs to God and there is an eternal glory waiting for them. So they live differently. Paul, Paul talks about this. He, he indicates this in Philippians 3, 17. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Like how to live my life. Join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he compares two ways of living. He, he says there are people who, who live with their minds fixed on earthly realities. They fix uh, their, their minds on the things of this world. Their God is their bellies. They, they, they live for this day. They walk in shame of the cross of Christ. That Their end, their, their, their final spot is destruction. But you as a Christian, you're not supposed to live like that with your mind fixed on your home in heaven. You live like Paul. You imitate Paul. You follow Paul as he follows Christ. You look at other saints around you, Christians who are more mature than you, who have done this a little longer than you. Okay, I need to, I need to, I need to live like that. I'm expected to live a certain way because this is not my home. My citizenship changes the way I live here. It changes the way I live out my, my days. To know our destiny is a great incentive for how we live. It's a, it's a great driving force to the day that you live out every single, every single day in the face of troubles and hardships. Uh, you, your mind is fixed that heaven is your home. You belong in heaven so you can do it. You can live like a citizen of heaven. Second, it's custom fit for you. It's custom fit for you. You can fill that in. Your home in heaven, it's custom fit for you. If you think about your days on earth and the temptations that Satan has put in front of you, it's often in the wisdom of, of Satan that he custom fits every temptation for you just right, just the right amount of temptation, just the right type of temptation at the right time. He, he's very crafty and, and, and he will custom fit temptation for you that you will fall into sin. In, in the reverse, Christ is custom fitting your home in glory. 
And just like Satan has fitted every temptation to pull you down, Christ is, is, is custom fitting everything in glory for you to rise. It's a wonderful truth. There's a place called heaven, an actual place, a literal place, not, not just clouds, and not just golden gates floating across the sky. No, an actual, literal place. And Jesus says he was going there. He says, I'm going to this place called heaven. I'm going there. Like it's somewhere you can get to and, and leave. He, he talks about heaven in a way that most people don't talk about heaven. He talks about heaven like you might talk about New York, right? Like I'm going to New York. There's an actual literal place I can go to. And when I get there, it's different than this place. And, and Jesus talks about heaven like that. He says, I'm going to this place, an actual place, a custom uh, that, that I'm preparing for you. It's custom fit for you. What did he mean when he said he's going to prepare a place for his disciples? I, I don't know if we have the full answer there. I don't. I don't see the full answer in scripture. I don't know of any passage in the Bible that directly tells us exactly what this means. But as I thought about it, I, I thought maybe the emphasis on this verse, maybe we get it all wrong. Well, I think we read that verse, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and we focus on the word prepare. What if we focus on the word for you Instead, this custom fit idea. In that case, then the emphasis would not be upon whatever architecture uh, alterations the Lord might be making in heaven, but rather upon the fact that it is for us as individuals. He's making it for you. In, in other words, in other words, this promise of this great home that we have with the Father, there's a place in that home, there's a, a room in that home that's being particularly, specifically prepared for you. For you individually. Have you ever decorated or rearranged a room specifically for someone else? Like with someone else in mind, not, not by your own preferences, but for someone else. Gr growing up, um, every few years, my parents would give us a room makeover. Um, and uh, we could rearrange it. Sometimes uh, if, if we could get some new furniture. Um, almost always there was new paint involved. Um, one year, my, my brother decided he didn't want carpet and he didn't want hardwood. He wanted concrete. Right? And, and my mom is very creative and she can do all sorts of things. And so we were able to do quite almost anything we wanted with our rooms, as long as we still had a place to sleep, right? Um, we could, every few years, we got a chance to, to refresh it, redo it, perhaps to fit our newest hobby. Um, I had a friend whose parents did this too, and he loved golf and he got this big golf mural and he got rid of the bed and put a hammock in his room. And uh, it was so cool for like a few months, and then it was so uncomfortable, right? Um, but my, my parents would let us custom fit this room. We'd put preparation into it. It was always cool. Sometimes it was a gift for our birthday or whatever because it's expensive to do that stuff. But, but we would take care, and we would put this all together. And you, you think about, I, I was thinking about how, how much care I put into my own rooms. And then eventually I got a house and it's like, well, there's lots of rooms, right? And there's a yard and there's all these things. And uh, when I got my, my, my recent house, the, the backyard was just asphalt. And I was like, well, that, that doesn't work for kids and dogs and privacy. And so well, I, I, I had the challenge, but the opportunity to custom make this backyard, to take it from asphalt to a backyard. And so I pulled out the pad and I'm drawing and I'm making things and we'll put the fire pit here and we'll do this here. And then one day I came to church and my wife was like, we're getting chickens. I was like, oh, um, 
So I had a chicken coop. Um, so, you know, and you, you begin to work this thing out. I don't know how many drawings we made of the backyard to get the backyard we have now. We made so many little drawings just to get this custom fit backyard. And it's little. We don't have a big yard, a big house or anything like that. But, it, but it's ours. And it's custom fit. And, and Micah's room, I remember moving into the house and custom making everything into the room so he would have space for all the lizards and things that he has and he could still have his bunk and the lizards weren't in the bunk and things like, you know, important things. It's custom fit. And I think through all the preparation, all the work that went into that and to hear that Jesus is preparing a place for me, for you, a custom fit place. And and I don't know the details, but I know Jesus is good and wonderful and powerful and perfect, and he knows you better than you know yourself, and he's preparing a place for you. How wonderful will that be? You think Chip and Joanna know what they're doing, right? Just wait till you see Jesus. (laughs) Move that bus, right? It's gonna be awesome. Number three, it's an everlasting home. It's an everlasting home. When you think of home, it's an everlasting place for you. It's a literal everlasting place for you. It it tells us that when he says it's a place for you, it tells us heaven's not only a place, but it's also a home. It's a place that houses you. You. It's a home. Home is at the the basic foundational desires of every human heart. There's a longing for home. It it is the desire to have a genuine place of our own, a home, a place where we belong, uh, where we can be ourselves, where we can let loose, where the walls protect us a little bit from everyone else. We need a home. If you see this, if you read the scriptures, you'll actually see this idea, this theme of longing for a home is seen throughout scripture. It's a huge theme in scripture. You can think of Adam and Eve and they're in the garden, but then they sin and they're they're alienated from God from their sin and they get expelled. They, They get pushed out of the garden, out of their home because of their sin. And so from that point on, as you read through the text, you'll see it. You'll, as you read through the Bible, you'll see over and over and over again this longing for home. God has put this longing into our hearts, this longing for an eternal, everlasting home. And we see it all the way in Adam and Eve. And then you think of Cain. Cain, who, because he killed his brother, was condemned to a life of wandering. And so once again, now at Cain, he had no home. By Genesis 11, we find men trying to create a city with homes that will be established, but these men of Babel are uh, are living opposed to God, so God scatters them across the world, and again, they are made homeless. So sin brings alienation, and alienation makes you lose your home. You eventually get to Abraham in Scripture. When you get to Abraham, he is actually taken from his home as a kind of rescue mission, his home of sin and, and, and suffering. And he's told by God that he will give him a land I will show you. So Abraham obeys. He steps out looking for this land that God will show him. And then God gives him this land and he gives him specific boundaries to this land in Genesis 15. He says from the river Egypt, the the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenzazites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Rephatites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the the Girgashites, the Jebusites. These are literal people. These are concrete things. These are real names. They actually exist in history, and they show that God has an awareness that you don't just need a place figuratively. You don't need just a place spiritually. You need a place literally. You need a physical place, a place to belong. So he calls Abraham out. He says, I'll take you to a land that I will show you. And he shows him a land and he says, your land is this entire place. You're going to need it because you're going to have a lot of kids. This longing for home, you can think of the Israelites wandering through the wilderness and as they wander, they're 
they're searching, they're, they're wandering for the promised land home. And then when you get to the New Testament, when it speaks of Abraham, this, this man chosen by God, called out from his home of sin to wander to this land that God would show him. And when you get into the New Testament in Hebrews, it speaks of Abraham. And Abraham is praised, not because he fixed his hope on his earthly home, but because he looked to his heavenly home. So if you read the story of Abraham, you could think, man, this guy is really obsessed with having a good family and having a great home. But when you get to Hebrews, it says he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Abraham gets praised in his faith chapter in the New Testament, not because he found home on earth, but because he looked forward, he had a vision he had his mind set on a home that is everlasting, whose foundation and designer and builder is God, Jesus, who prepares a place for you. That's where his, his mind is, is focused, his, his heart is set, not on having walls here, but on having a literal, physical, real place in heaven. The basic need for home, going back to Eden, is fully met only when the Lord Jesus Christ himself prepares a home for us in heaven. It's garden to garden. It's paradise to paradise. That is our home, and it is an everlasting home. For now we are in a strange land, and it is strange. But on that day, we shall be in the Father's house and shall be home to an everlasting home. Peter says it's an, an inheritance undefiled and, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, where you're given a crown that will not fade away. It's an everlasting home. Fourth, it's home is with Jesus. This, this home that we're talking about is with Jesus. As I, I spend all this time telling you that heaven's a real place, it's a literal place, it's a physical place, and it's a place custom fit for you that's everlasting. And, and now I wanna tell you that none of it would matter if Jesus wasn't there. That Jesus is what makes home home. Jesus' presence is what makes us long for heaven. It's what makes heaven so great is because Jesus is there. That's what he says. I go to prepare a place for you. You're going to come with me. Look at verse three. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. That you, sorry, I'm, I, different translation in my head. That where I am, you may be also. So Jesus, what, what makes heaven so wonderful, what makes heaven home, what makes home so awesome is that Jesus is there and he's telling his disciples, and I, I want you to hear it tonight, in the troubles, in the disappointments, in the worries, fill your mind with thoughts of home. Think about heaven because that's where Jesus is and a day will come when he will come again and take you, not to place you somewhere, but that you would actually be with him. That where he is, you will be. In 1 Thessalonians, we see this. Paul says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. When you read Revelation 21, you think about how wonderful this passage is. These things are only true because Jesus is there says, then I saw a new heaven 
and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. What makes heaven awesome is God is with us. And, he, and you will always be with Jesus forever if, if you belong to Christ. And, and because God is with us, because Jesus is there and he's prepared a place for us, verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So people like to talk about heaven. In heaven, there's no weeping, there's no crying, there's no pain, there's no sin, there's no... And yes, amen. But that's only true because Jesus is there. Because Jesus has prepared a way for you to everlasting life. Because Jesus will come again to, to draw you to himself, to take you with him to heaven, to take you to this everlasting home. Home is with Jesus. That is what makes heaven a real home to us. And if you think about your own home, home is only home because of the people. A lot of people really struggle with home once all the people move out. Marriages struggle and things begin to unravel because all of a sudden it doesn't feel like home. It's the same place. Same walls, same furniture, same smell. But it doesn't feel like home because the people aren't there. Deal Moody, when he, he talks about this, he tells of this child whose mother got really sick and uh, at first they thought she was going to get better. And it was just this single mom with this child. And um, as time went on, they realized that this mom was crippling away and she was going to die. And they didn't want this young, young girl to see their, her mom suffer. And so a friend t took the da daughter away while the mom died at the request of the mother. And in time, uh, the, mom, the mom died. And in that time, the daughter's asking, where's my mom? I want to see my mom. I want to see my mom. Not knowing that her mom had died. And well-meaning people decided that they weren't going to tell her until she was a little bit older what happened to her mom. She was very young and it was very tragic the way her mom died. And Eventually, they had to bring the girl back to the home, and she got to the home, and she went running around and went into uh, the, the room where her mom would sit, and she looked for her mom, and her mom wasn't there, and then she, she went to the kitchen to look for her mom, and her mom wasn't there, and she went to her mom's bedroom, and her mom wasn't there, and she came back to the people and said, I want to leave. Why? Because even though she had been gone from home so long, home wasn't home without mom. And she knew it. Heaven without Jesus is in heaven. It's not a home you want to be at. To know that we're going to heaven is a wonderful thing, but more wonderful still is the fact that we shall see Jesus and shall be able to worship him as he ought to be worshiped and praise him for all that he's done. Number five. It's home with each other. It's home with each other. So we will ask, in heaven, will I see and recognize other people? Um, I believe the answer is yes. I, I don't have a super definitive answer from the scriptures that the answer is yes, but I have a few verses I want to share with you. These are just some thoughts on home. I believe in heaven you'll be able to recognize one another. I believe it's one of the gifts God gives us. You look in the Old Testament, there's this phrase, and it's all over the Old Testament, and it, they use it in connection with the death of, of the patriarchs, um, and the phrase is, and he was gathered to his people. He was gathered to his people. And, and some people say that that phrase means uh, that when they died, they were just buried in like cemeteries where their people were buried, except for in the 
text we're looking at today. Uh, we don't have time to break all of them down, but you can go and do this. If you look at where many of these patriarchs are buried, they're not buried with their people. <laughs> They're buried in the wilderness and away from their people and far away. I, I think the text is speaking of, of heaven. I want to show you a few of these. We'll go quickly. Genesis 25, 8. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Genesis 25, 17. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Genesis 35, 29, Isaac breathed his last, he died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. Genesis 49, 33, when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Numbers 20, 24, let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel. And there's, there's more. We don't have time to get into all of them. Think of David upon being told of the death of his son through Bathsheba. And he's praying and praying for the child to live and the child dies. In 2 Samuel 12, 22, he said, while the child was still alive, I, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So David apparently believed that he would go to his son. In the New Testament, we find other things that indicate, I believe, the same truth. You think of the Mount of Transfiguration in, in Luke. And um, on this occasion, the Lord took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to the mountain and... Uh, uh, this amazing thing happens, and Moses and Elijah, two other dead saints, are there, and they appeared by him, and Luke calls them men, which is interesting, not, not spirits, not disembodied something, but men. And then Peter, and presumably all the others, recognized them. Luke 9, 33 said, And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for for Elijah. So Peter apparently recognized these dead saints. Matthew 8, 11, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west. This is a promise to the Gentiles. Recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This idea that there's a table with patriarchs at it that you will, you will know, you will recognize. Um, so many of us have lost believing loved ones and have faced that hardship. I, I don't believe we've lost them ultimately. Of course, they're with Jesus, but you also, I believe, will be reunited with them one day. I don't know how distracted you'll be by them. I think you'll be pretty fixated on Christ, but I do think you'll know them. Moody again tells of a man who testified that in his youth he thought heaven largely as a great shining city filled with vast walls, domes and towers, and populated by millions of angels, all of whom were strangers to them. But then his little brother died, and he thought of heaven as a great shining city filled with vast walls, towers, and unknown angels, but now also with them was one little guy he knew. And then when a second brother died, there were two he knew, and acquaintances died, and in time one of his children went to be with Jesus, this one was followed by another and then still another. And by the time the man was old, he seldom thought of the walls and towers. He thought of those residents of the celestial city whom he knew and his interest in heaven intensified. Toward the end of his life, so many of his acquaintances had gone to heaven that it sometimes seemed to him that he knew more people in heaven than he did on earth. And of course, his thoughts fixed increasingly on that distant place. I think it encourages us to know that we'll be reunited with each other in heaven. I have to go quickly. Six, we will be all we were meant to be. 
we will be all we were meant to be. We shall see each other not as we are now or have been, but as we are meant to be. In 1 John 3, he says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we, will, we shall see him as he is. And that day, we will have a fresh view of each other. Sin will be removed. Uh, the, the penalties of sin, the drawings of sin, uh, the results of sin, the ignorance, the anger, the hate, the weariness, all of it will be removed. And will we see each other as we are meant to be? And seven, rewards are waiting. Rewards are waiting. We will see each other rewarded for faithful service in this life. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense or reward with me to repay each one for what he has done. Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26. And you think about the patriarchs as we talked about how they had their minds, they're out, they're totally fixed on heaven. And Hebrews eleven twenty six 26 says, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. In the day of our heavenly reunion, we shall have those rewards. I'm not telling you to live your life to get the rewards. That would not be right. But live your life in sight of Christ. Serve him faithfully. Love each other. Think of and long for the day of glory, a place for you, a custom fit, everlasting home for you with Jesus and with each other and with rewards. You think Christmas presents under the tree waiting is special. All the rewards waiting for us. We shall live forevermore in our home with Christ and each other. We shall be free from the burden of sin. We shall be free from pain. We shall rejoice in the favor of our Lord. Amen. Would you stand? I'd love to pray with you. Lord, help us to live our lives with our mind fixed on home. Home with you, home with each other, home in heaven, custom fit for us. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to imagine some theoretical place, some mystical place, but God, we have a real home with you, we are citizenships. We are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we thank you for it. Lord, remove any doubts we have, any fears we have, and Lord, even the troubles that we face each day, because our mind is fixed on home with you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you Sunday. What an encouraging message from Pastor Dave. We're so glad that you have been here, that you've stayed all the way through. Don't forget, since you stayed all the way through, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit the notification button. There's so much happening for you and your entire family here at MCA. And we don't want to see you here on the MCA The Church YouTube page. No, we want to see you here on Sundays. Sundays at 9 and 11 and Wednesdays at 7. We know that there's something for you and your entire family here, and we want you to be a part of it. Stay involved in your community. Stay involved in Marina Valley, wherever you're from. Stay involved. And if you would like to give, go to mcathechurch.com, go to the giving tab, and give to our mission of exposing the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has truly changed everything. And we're so glad that you're here and that you're part of our church. Have a blessed week.